Hello and welcome back to my channel, Wild Like a Flower Gardening. In this video, I'm going to be talking about my newfound love of tomatoes and what varieties I've purchased for the 2021 growing season. I'm also going to take a little bit of time to talk to you about how we can show caterpillars a little more mercy in our gardens this summer. I really appreciate you joining me today and if you wouldn't mind, please hit that like and subscribe button to better support me and my journey to provide you with information on our native pollinators and how we can make our gardens more friendly for them. So I'll be completely honest, um, you would never catch me eating a tomato before this summer. I hate tomatoes, I pull them off of sandwiches, I refuse to put them on my tacos, I cry when they're on my salads, I do not like tomatoes at all. This has been a thing since I was a child. I will eat some ketchup, however, and some tomato soup, but I have just never jived with raw tomatoes. So this summer, I had the intentions to start a little apartment garden. Now, if you haven't watched my other videos, a quick description of what I've been working with here is I have no in-ground growing space. I have no in-ground growing space and I have limited space to keep pots without getting myself into trouble. So, since I don't have any in-ground growing space, I had a really lovely container garden out front with lots of beautiful native wildflowers and other flowers and some herbs. And it was very landlord friendly, if you will. I think I even caught him taking pictures of it in the summer, which really scared me because I thought I was in trouble. But then he told me that it was beautiful and that he thought it was great. So awesome. Now, what I was doing for my vegetable gardening, I had them in my sneaky garden. My sneaky garden was out back behind the apartment where you know people who are coming and going are not really going to see it. It's not really going to reflect on the complex if it looks unruly. And to be honest, I don't know if the landlord ever knew that it was there. Um, I'll include some pictures as we go to kind of give you an idea of how awful it looked, um, but it worked. I grew uh, tomatoes, peppers, and I had a lot of fun doing it. What did I grow this year? Well, I didn't grow very much. I was recommended to grow some Cherokee purples, um, which are these guys right here, and they did okay. I honestly gave a lot away to my mom um, in her garden, and she had a lot more luck with her tomatoes than I did, and I enjoyed them. I definitely took a bunch home from her garden because she was overwhelmed with tomatoes. The ones that I had, um, I had them in pots, and they didn't do as great because I think the container size was a little bit too small. I will probably grow them again in the 2021 growing season, but I'm not going to devote a ton of space to them. I really like them, but I have a feeling there are some other varieties I would like a lot more. Um, and then I also grew some cherry tomatoes. I am a bit of a bigger fan of cherry tomatoes. If you were to catch me eating a tomato back in the day, it would have likely been a cherry tomato, not one of these big beef steaks. So what I was looking forward to was growing some yellow cherry tomatoes. I bought this little multi-pack from the local store and the seeds are color coded. So I did not grow any of the red ones. I did start some and then give them away to friends. So that way the seeds weren't um, totally for naught. I grew the sun golds and the sweet golds and I was really impressed with them. So both my cherry tomatoes and my um, Cherokee purple tomatoes, I grew them in pots this big. This wasn't that awful. The cherry tomatoes did really well in a pot this big, but the Cherokee purple really did not enjoy this pot. I think that if I do another beefsteak tomato, I'm going to need to put it in a larger pot. At the beginning of the growing season, this was the biggest kind of pots that I had access to. And towards later on in the summer, I had purchased some really big pots for my native wildflowers. And I think some of those pots are gonna be what I use for my big tomatoes this coming growing season because I think they dried out really fast. Uh, they didn't hold a lot of water to begin with and they just really didn't seem like they were living their best life in these, in these pots. I planned to specifically buy yellow varieties for this growing season. I don't love the red ones. I think that they are okay, but I am much more attracted to the flavors of yellow tomatoes. I was able to get my hands on a few big yellow tomatoes from the farmer's market this summer. I don't know what kind of varieties they were and I didn't save the seeds, but I liked them a lot more in comparison. Um, I ended up making a ton of tomato sandwiches this summer, which my mother thought that was insane because again, I don't eat tomatoes and here I am throwing them on tomato sandwiches left and right. So I am really excited. 
uh, for the seed varieties that I have purchased for this coming summer and to turn them into tomato sandwiches. I'm not even gonna lie. So now I'm gonna go through the seeds that I have purchased for the 2021 growing season. I sourced my seeds from Baker Creek. I have no affiliations with them, but I ordered from them because they had the largest selection of yellow tomatoes. And I didn't really want to be ordering a yellow tomato here and a yellow tomato there from all kinds of different seed companies. I just wanted to do one order. Um, I don't know if I'm going to have more growing space this coming summer. I may spend the summer in this apartment again, or I may be moving, I'm not entirely sure yet, but I am going to be planning my garden under the impression that I'm working with the same amount of space that I had this summer. And knowing that I don't have a ton of space, I really didn't want a giant seed collection because I may not be able to grow every variety that I purchased. So I wanted to keep it very narrow into the things that I know that I would be excited to grow and excited to eat. So to start off the tomatoes that I bought, I really wanted more cherry tomatoes. I think I like them more than anything. Uh, but they don't do so great on tomato sandwiches. I really enjoyed roasting my yellow cherry tomatoes with some basil and garlic that I was also growing. And so I have purchased a few varieties of cherry tomatoes again because I really, really enjoyed that. So the first tomatoes that I've purchased um, are Barry's Crazy Cherry Tomatoes. These guys, they looked great. They look kind of similar to the ones that I have grown. And size-wise, they were pretty on par with um, the size of the plants that I was working with this summer. So I felt that they are something that I could totally accomplish in my garden. The other cherry tomato variety I've purchased is the Napa Chardonnay. I have heard really good things from other garden bloggers. And even though I know you can't taste what people are talking about in their videos, they were described as really good and I would really love to try them and see if I like them. If I don't, I'll just let the caterpillars have them. So on to some of the larger tomatoes that I'm going with. I got a pineapple tomato. These looked beautiful. I can't tell you anything about what they're gonna taste like because I haven't grown them yet, but I am really excited. These look like a tomato ready to go on a tomato sandwich. Now this one, I have heard a few different bloggers pronounce it differently, so I am going to go with the way that I've heard it. Not probably the correct way. Um, this is Dr. Witchies, White Cheese, Wishes, I, help me. Um, but this is another tomato that looks like it would be really great on tomato sandwiches. I know you're hearing me say tomato sandwiches a lot. And for me, the way that I prefer to eat my tomatoes is raw. I do like to preserve them sometimes for different like spaghetti recipes. But for the most part, I had more fun eating these tomatoes raw on tomato sandwiches with basil and some mozzarella cheese and a little bit of vinaigrette. So I intend to be growing these specifically for how I intend to eat them. And I plan to be growing these tomatoes to put them on sandwiches because I don't have a lot of intentions to preserve them. Living in an apartment, I don't have a lot of storage space. So preserving is really difficult for me. Um, I did make some sauces and I really love those. And like I had said before, I roasted some uh, cherry tomatoes and preserved them in a confit, which was really great. But these are things that I used throughout the summer. And once the fall and winter has rolled around, I don't have them anymore because I couldn't grow enough or save enough um, because I don't have any space here. The other tomatoes are not quite yellow, but these just really caught my eye because they're very pretty and I'm very curious to see how the flavor profile compares to both red tomatoes and some of the yellow tomato varieties that I got. But these are the Berkeley tie-dye um, or green tie-dye and like look at the, how cool they look. So I'm very curious to see flavor profile, what these are like compared to the others. And since I do intend to be eating them mostly raw on tomato sandwiches, I think it'll be really easy to compare and contrast. Not quite a tomato, but something that I have heard really good things about that I really wanted to try um, is some ground cherries. Now, I know that these are very similar growing wise to tomatoes. They kind of look like tomatillos. And so I have confidence in myself that I should be able to grow these and I should be able to at least have a decent amount to try them and see if I like them. So how did I grow my tomatoes here at my apartment? Well, I had one of those tall greenhouse garden shelving units that you can put like a plastic cover over top of. I'm gonna be completely honest with you. The inexpensive garden greenhouse with the plastic cover, um, I was not impressed. The plastic cover did nothing for me. Um, when it was outside in the spring before um, it got really warm to where I felt comfortable taking it off, what would happen is the sun would overheat that greenhouse, 
and burn my plant babies. And if I were to take it off, they would get just blasted by chilly temperatures that were also not good for them. I don't have very good sunlight in my apartment, so I thought that that would be a really great alternative to trying to grow a lot of these plant babies in my windowsills, but it resulted in really limited success, so I ended up putting them in my windowsills anyways until it was warm enough to put them outside. The only thing I will say, once the temperatures sort of evened out a little bit and it was not as cold at night and I could leave it open during the day, the only plus side I would say for me keeping that cover on was that it helped protect them from wind. It kept them from being blown and knocked over and from being overwhelmed by wind. Um, I know you don't want to completely cut them off from airflow because you want strong plants, but sometimes these gusts of winds behind the apartments would pick up so much that it would just throw everything that I have. So that was the only plus side. I don't anticipate using that cover again. It ripped a lot. It did not do well in the elements. Um, so I probably will toss it. I won't lie. So once it became warm enough and I had my plants in their bigger pots, like these guys here, I did not plan to use tomato cages. I bought some, but I had other ideas on how I wanted to use these tomato cages that did not have anything to do with my tomato plants. What I did do was I bought one of these like netting trellises. And is it still, yeah, $3.99, super inexpensive. And I took this trellis and I laid it over my shelving unit. I had two cherry tomato plants per pot and I had two pots. So I had four cherry tomato plants in total. And I had those two pots next to each other on one side and I was training them to grow up and over the little trellis and the shelving unit. And on the other side, I had two pots with one large tomato plant in them each and I was training those to go up and over. Now, I would say that the large tomato varieties needed a bigger pot, so you could tell that they were a little bit stunted, but the cherry tomatoes, they grew up and they grew over, almost encroaching on the other tomato plants. Now, on the shelving units inside is where I had my um, pepper plants, my jalapenos and my red peppers, and because I have a lot of sun that would hit them face on, nobody was really overshadowing one another. So it worked out really well. It was really weird. Um, I'm not gonna lie, it looked like Cousin It if he was a tomato plant. Um, and that was why I call it my sneaky garden because I didn't per se really want my landlord to see this. Um, but it worked out really well for me. I got to eat tomatoes all summer. So who's really gonna complain, right? If I grow them again here at this apartment, I will probably do something similar. Now the only issue that I need to figure out is water. So the tomato plants were kind of underneath the lip of my roof. And so when it rained, I didn't get a lot of that natural watering. So I had to really stay on top of watering on my own. And so sometimes these plants would dry out more than you'd want. And they, I could tell they were getting a little bit on the stressed side. So it puts me in an uncomfortable position because I don't want my garden sitting in the lawn where the landscaping guys have to work around it. But I think if I could pull my unit maybe six inches away from the apartment building because I had it snugged up underneath the roof where there is no grass to be bothering. If I could pull it out a few inches and they could just weed whack around it, um, I think that that might allow the plants to get rainwater and not be so stressed. And it will hopefully result in me having healthier plants. Now, I have a few more varieties than I did this year, so I'm going to be having a lot more individual plants and so if I am still in this apartment, I do need to figure out where I'm going to put them and how I could potentially trellis them again. I think using that shelving unit is going to be a good idea for cherry tomatoes, but I'm going to have to come up with some other ideas for these larger tomatoes and probably the ground cherries simply because I don't have enough space. So if you have any ideas on how I can have really confined tomato plants, let me know. I am thinking of maybe trying to grow them more ornamentally and leaving them on my front porch because my front porch is able to get rainwater because there's a big sidewalk and it's space that you can put plants or pots for plants uh, without you know intruding on the lawn where the landscapers have to mow. So I think that um, if I do have some varieties that I don't think are going to be able to stay out of the way out back, I'm going to try to find a way to incorporate them out front and make them look nice, kind of pretty, and um, hopefully not annoy my landlord too much. <laughs>
Cheers to Ohio. I would like to talk a little bit about a garden nemesis that many of you probably loathe, okay? If you're unfamiliar with my channel, I am a pollinator conservationist, and I advocate for pollinators in every way that I can. I, and there's a particular pollinator that we love that most gardeners do not, and it is the tomato hornworm. I know, I know, I can hear you shrieking now. I, I can, so just hang on. I know that they are the bane of tomato plants and nightshade varieties, I get that, however, the tomato hornworm is a native pollinator to North America and it turns into a lovely little sphinx moth. So what I did this summer was I took the tomato plant that I liked the least, which honestly was the Cherokee purples because I was not getting as many fruits compared to the foliage as I was with my cherry tomatoes. And honestly, whenever I'd find a tomato hornworm on my plants, I'd move them over to the Cherokee purple. I also took tomato hornworms out of my boss's garden this summer and I took them home and I put them on my own tomato plants, okay? Because I don't think that they should be squished or thrown into the trash. They deserve to live out their life cycle. And also, by the time you find them, they're usually very big. So they're pretty much done developing and they're gonna crystallize soon anyways. So what I'm asking is when you find tomato hornworms in your garden, perhaps grow a sacrificial tomato plant or two that you can move them over to those plants. Now, something else that's very beneficial about tomato hornworms is that there is a parasitizing wasp that will lay its eggs on the tomato hornworms and they burrow inside and develop and when they are ready, they emerge and then they will form almost like a silk cocoon I'm gonna put a picture up, but I'm only gonna put it up for a few short seconds because I don't wanna make anyone's scalps itch because I don't like the look of stuff like this either. But this is a tomato hornworm with these parasitic wasp cocoons on it. Now hear me out, please, for the sake of the freaking ecosystems. When you see a tomato hornworm that has these little silk cocoons on them, leave it alone. That caterpillar is already doomed. It's likely going to die a very slow death. If you want to be kind, I do know quite a few gardeners that will dispatch their tomato hornworms. They won't impact the wasps that are on them. However, they will, you know, kill the tomato hornworm so it doesn't have to die slowly. So once you see those though, please leave it alone because those wasps are almost done developing as well and there's not really much more damage that tomato hornworm is gonna cause on your tomato plant. Now, something even cooler. So there's the parasitizing wasp that uses the tomato hornworm. There is also another parasitizing, I think it's another wasp as well, that will parasitize the wasp cocoons on the caterpillar. So you have two organisms using the tomato hornworm. The braconid wasp parasitizes the tomato hornworm and the next guy parasitizes the wasp. If you were to remove the tomato hornworms from your ecosystem, you are also now minimizing the necessary habitat or host for two other species. If you want to promote a happy and healthy ecosystem in your garden or your yard or your property on a bigger scale, you want to keep these tomato hornworms. Now I know that sometimes that's not possible. I know that sometimes infestations can really limit your crop your livelihood, your ability to feed your families. So what I'm not saying is let the tomato hornworms run free and eat all of your plants to where you, the gardener, are suffering. But what I am asking is that instead of pillaging their populations in your garden, you find a safer alternative for them. If you have the space to grow a sacrificial tomato plant, please do. It would make my heart immensely happy because not only are we going to be seeing sphinx moths, we will be seeing two other species that are allowed to function and be fruitful in your ecosystem. Now, I know that tomato hornworms are not always the only caterpillar to be found on tomato plants. I was pretty shocked towards the end of the season to find a yellow striped army worm on my tomato plant. I didn't at the time take the best photos, but this is what it looked like. Now, doing some digging, this is a friend that will unfortunately use quite a few different vegetable plants in your garden. But it is also another native moth. 
So at this point in the season, I was kind of tired of eating all these cherry tomatoes. So I just let them do their thing. I think I counted four total. So it wasn't really like I was losing a lot by letting them hang out on my plant. Um, both my tomato hornworms and my yellow striped armyworms did eat some of my fruits, but I was pretty sick of tomatoes by then and it didn't really bother me. And I kind of just let those tomato plants go to the caterpillars towards the end of the season, which is something else that you can do. If your plants are pretty much done fruiting or you're uninterested in eating those fruits, go ahead and just leave them. I mean, what are you going to do anyways? Rip them out and leave bare soil? Let those tomato plants live longer and provide a habitat for these different caterpillars, especially if you're indifferent to those tomato plants at this point in the season. Now, both of these species do have native varieties of host plants that they would use. The tomato hornworm uses a lot of nightshade species and there are native varieties. However, I will say that even if you put the native variety of host plants right next to your tomato plants, you're probably still going to end up with tomato hornworms on your tomato plant. It's kind of inevitable. I think they really like tomato plants. So this is a relationship that we kind of just have to accept as is. So I know there are quite a few solutions of growing different plants next to tomato plants to encourage, you know, tomato hornworms to use them or to try to deter tomato hornworms. As a pollinator conservationist and ecologist, that's not going to work. You can put a buffet of other plants right next to your tomato plant, and that is not going to save them, unfortunately. These sphinx moths have adapted to using tomato plants and will readily lay their eggs on them regardless of what you plant next to them. Maybe you will get lucky and they will also lay eggs on the other varieties of nightshades and native nightshades that you plant near your tomato plants. Cool! However, you will probably still see tomato hornworms on your tomato plants no matter what you do. Now, you could be crazy and you could spray pesticides, but we're not going to go there. We're not going to talk about that because I don't believe that pesticides have a place in our gardens because they have such negative impacts on not just the pests that would use the particular plant in question, but on the ecosystems as a whole. So I would recommend refraining from pesticides, period, because it's not very fair to the native ecosystems that you're choosing to grow your garden in. And that's all I'm going to say about pesticides, because I don't feel like being yelled at right now. But all I'm saying is, go ahead and grow whatever you want next to your tomato plants, but please do not be surprised when it doesn't work. It's kind of like saying, hey, I want to put this old frumpy couch next to a really fluffy, comfy, brand new couch. What couch are you gonna wanna sit on? You're gonna wanna sit on the new fluffy one, right? You're not gonna wanna sit on the old one. So you can put these other plants next to them, but they may not be as attractive as a yummy, juicy tomato plant. So please show these caterpillars a little bit of mercy in your garden this summer. I know that it can be difficult and sometimes overwhelming, so you have to do what's best for you in your garden, but if you wouldn't mind doing me and the caterpillars a favor, please have an open heart for them this summer. Thank you for joining and happy gardening.